And it's my privilege today to invite to the pulpit uh, Sean Blicknot from Port Elizabeth. Well, good evening. It's good to be in Cape Town, cold. I want to say thank you to Apostle Thamo and Roland, and the leadership of this house, uh, Pastor Sneeman, Peter, his dad, and the leadership of this house to have us to use this building for this occasion. We know that this is a place from which the Lord wants to make some declarations. It's no longer a place that is physical, but has become the mount of God, from which he wants to transact with us. So there's divine transactions taking place. And the speakings of the Lord is the imperative, that we need to go beyond the voice of a man and determine the heart of God as the voice is just the interpreter of that which is in the heart of God. And tonight I would like to speak to you something that's very close to my heart, <clears throat> pick up on the theme that Apostle Thamo has started earlier on. He began to define the kingdom, and uh, the burden that I currently have is the Lord has not made me to shift from this burden to speak about the kingship of the sons of God. And tonight I would like to talk about that, see how far we get. Um, but before we do that, um, there is a relationship that exists, it, an eternal relationship that pre-existed time. It is a relationship that has got to do with the eternal Godhead. In God there's Father, and in God there's Son, and there's Spirit. This relationship was the most, or is the most endearing, most deepest, most profound, intimate, affectionate relationship that ever, ever existed. It is this relationship between a father and his son. Before the creative activity of God, this relationship existed. And this relationship is what he, God, wanted to extend into a human family. But to make it visible through a human family. And so this relationship, I want to talk a little bit about this relationship because I sense him so deeply here in this place tonight. That if you can hear really deep in the spirit that he's eavesdropping upon us tonight. And I felt, I feel right now so tender because he's here in all his glory. The Holy Spirit is making him real. He's right there where you are seated, just there. And he wants to carry the voice of a man. And in that voice, he wants to amplify his voice. So I don't want you to see me. It's got nothing to do with me. It's got to do that with that which God wants to transact with us. The things that is deep, profound, on his heart, that he wants his church to know. Often I sense and I feel the affections and the emotions that he's going through. Say, God, let me feel that which you feel. That which you are feeling right now. As you are seated upon your throne. And Lord, help me in some little way just to, to communicate that. Being caught in flesh 
and our flesh and our minds get sometimes in the way of how to communicate that which, we f- that which he feels. And uh, it's difficult to stand here. I feel so unqualified. I feel that it's so difficult. But I know the one that is the ancient of days that can communicate with us. So I want us to hear his heart tonight. The deepest, most profound thoughts that is in his father's heart toward us, his people. God loves the human race, not just the church. He loves the entirety of humanity. Whether they be Muslim, Hindu, from what orientation they might be, what race orientation they might be, cultural inheritance they might be, God loves them equally. And the measurement of human life can only be validated by the thing that is the most precious to him, his blood. He purchased us with his own blood. Our value is vested in the blood. The blood was the way of procuring us to secure for him an inheritance in us. And the only thing that he could use that is the most precious was his own blood with which he bought us. He purchased us. He sought before time began in his pre-existent mind. He sought and then he slain the lamb before the foundation of the world. How can we comprehend this God? How can we understand him? But yet the Bible says he has given us the mind of Christ. It's a corporate mind. It's not a mind in one man. It's a conceptual process. It is us becoming that in the earth. God wants to help us to understand something that is so profound. The love relationship that always pre-existed man and the material universe. There was a love relationship between the father and the son. An eternal, intimate, deep, affectionate love relationship. And we are the result of that love that they in the Godhead bestowed on one another. The son could only function out of that love. The son could not do anything out from himself. So he would not do anything independent from the will of his father. He would continually uh, defer. He would live a life of deference, a life of subjecting himself, being God, to a placement in flesh. And he would suspend his deity. He would suspend his eternity that eternal dimension, and he would submit himself in flesh, in his incarnation, to his father. And he became the pattern son, the design, the template that we need to study to understand how this relationship with God the Father works. And so I want to talk a little bit about that tonight because I feel... So, uh, I feel so soft and brittle on the inside. As I was standing there, the Lord showed me this relationship. And I said, God, I don't know how to communicate this. But I will do my best if you help me to speak this. And so we see in the book of John, John chapter 1, I think it's verse 18. He talks about, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word 
was God, and he said in verse 18, and no man had seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, has declared him. The one that was in the bosom of the Father declared him. It's the word exegete. It's to take him out from the heart of the Father and to expose him and to make him known in all his characteristic attributes of deity. To reveal the deepest, most profound, intimate heart of God to man in the bosom of the Father. The bosom of the Father. Wow, I was looking at that term, the bosom of the Father, which reflect the deepest, most intimate place in the heart of the Father. This was the position that the Son held from all eternity. And God made a covenant within himself, an eternal covenant. And in that covenant he swore, because there was no one greater than him, so he swore by himself. When God swears on an oath, an oath, it's a legal transaction that God made with himself. There was nobody that he could swear by, so he swore by himself. And he made a commitment to himself that we will enter into covenantal agreement with one another that we want to extend this love relationship between us and incorporate the being that we will make out from ourselves. We want to make a being that carries our very image and our very likeness. And the reason and the purpose why we will make this being is that he, on our behalf, becomes a dominator, a ruler of what we will make as the environment out of which he must function. And so it's our profound desire as we speak to one another in the company of the Holy Ghost to form this covenant agreement to extend this love relationship, to incorporate within this relationship man that we will make in our own image and in our own likeness. But the purpose why we would make this human is that this human will reflect everything we are. That this human will carry the deepest image of who we are. That which we are in our identity, in our eternal attributes of deity, that we want to communicate to this being. We want this human to carry externally, showing dimensionally what we are in spirit. But we want to make this being just like us. This being will carry our very image, our very likeness. The word image there is tselem in the Hebrew, which literally means to carry and show forth the perfections of another. It's got nothing to do with external resemblance. It's got nothing to do with an external appearance. It's got to do with an internal manifestation of attributes of that which is invisible. To make it through the structure of human life visible in the earth. And that this human will have the divine right not just to eavesdrop onto conversations between us, but that they will be part of this family. We want to bring more into this family after our own likeness and our own identity. And so this is where the love story of Scripture starts. I see the Bible as a book of love, eternal love. Yes, there might be many themes that are running in the scriptures, but what I see when I read it is that there is a love theme running right through the scriptures. It's the love of the Father for His Son. One Son, a corporate Son, a Son that is all-inclusive, a Son that carries in Him deity and humanity, 
the fullness of God and the fullness of man within this new creation order. An order where God has fixated himself eternally into a posture that never previously existed in God. And now we have such a man seated on the throne, a God-man. And the Bible says that our conversation or our citizenship is in heaven. And from there we are awaiting a savior so that when he comes, our vile bodies will be turned into his glorious body. He is the first fruit. I'm talking about the head, the one that is the pattern, the one that is the image, the one that is, the, uh, is really the, the, the blueprint or the design in the, in the father heart of God into whom man had to come as his estate. I'm talking about the one seated on the throne, the one at the right hand of God in his majesty, the one that was exalted, the one whom Peter exclaimed about in the day of Pentecost, the same Jesus whom you crucified, God the Father has made him both Lord and Christ and seated him at the right hand in his majesty. And he is still seated and we need to have an objective view tonight of this Christ, this one that tainted himself as it were with Humanity. And now he is the God-man. And First Peter 2 verse 5 says that there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. We have a man in the most profound, highest order in the universe, seated upon a throne that showcases what we will become evidently in that new creation order. He's the first fruits of a new order of man. And that is what we will bear as we once bore the likeness of the man of dust. So we shall also bear the image and the likeness of the man from heaven. And so that is our future. That is what we are striving for. That's what we are living for. We want to be like him. We are already like him objectively, but we need to get to the place subjectively, inwardly. We need to come to that place of realization. That's why there is a striving. That's why there is this deep, intimate longing, like Paul would say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that while I'm in the tent of this body, I'm groaning. The only thing that Paul can express is that I'm groaning to be further clothed over with my heavenly dwelling. But while I'm in the tent of this body, the only uh, uh, pursuit for me or the only posture of my spirit is to have an internal groan within my heart to be further clothed over with my heavenly dwelling. I want to be like him in the entire fullness of what he always wanted man to be. And so that is the position that the church must come into. It's a place of not just having church services, but coming together to learn more that that yearning, that that deep sense of longing, that inner desire, that passion to become like him, that we will press toward that place of perfection, that we will have this vile bodies transformed in one moment, in a twinkling of an eye, to put on immortality. That's what we are after. We are tired of being uh, pinned down by the, the realms of flesh. We are tired of being pinned down by the atmospheric pressure of Babylonian mindsets and the things that the earth produce. We want to be, well, we want to be, uh, to be lifted up out from this miry condition. We want to come into that place. But if there is not a people that desire it, if there is not a people in the earth that long for it, that desire it, really desire it, not just coming to church to have another service, to feel the goosebumps of God upon our flesh, but to come to a place of recognizing that we want this dimension to end and we want to enter into a different dimension. 
We want time to come to its end. That we can be- go back into the eternity of time. We want out of this dimension. So that this flesh, this mortal structure in which our spirits are confined, that we can put on that which can walk through walls like he did with his glorious estate. Like when when he walked through the wall after his resurrection, when he appeared to the two disciples on the way to Emmaus, and he came up alongside them, and, they, and their eyes were withheld from recognizing him. But it was in the breaking of bread, when he broke the bread, that their eyes opened, and their hearts were burning. I want God to have our hearts burn tonight with desire. That there's an imprint of something deeper, more profound, that we long for. That we leave this place not sleeping tonight. That God will visit us in the, in the watches of the night. And we, and we get up and we moan and groan like Paul. God, I can't anymore. I want out, Lord. I don't want to be confined in this body. I want to put on immortality, Lord. I want to be transformed from this lowly estate into your glorious body. That is what the church is after. That is what true church is all about. Not about our meetings and our activities, but as to really have that place of deep inner longing to come to this most deepest profound desire to want to not just know him, but to have him. A relocation of him into the nearness of where we dwell that we become the eternal dwelling in time. That he will come from the dimension of the eternal, relocate into this glorious temple. We are the place of his dwelling. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about tonight. I feel my heart is overwhelmed with this love this deep love that the Father has for the Son. And God had us on His mind long before we had a choice to choose Him. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. He selected us. He blessed us. He sent reverberations through all realms of commendation of us. While we were yet sinners, he commended his love unto us. In that while we were yet far from him, we were on his thoughts. So he made a plan to bring us back to his bosom. To the most deepest affectionate place. In our placement. On the throne. We are the sons of God. Say we are the sons of God. We are the sons of God. We are no longer Christians. We are sons of God. Banish the term I'm a Christian. But I'm a son of God. I'm one that reflects him. In the earth. I carry the inward marks of the identification of who he is. There's in route in my spirit man. I am like him. The Bible says, as he is, so are we in this world. We are flesh of his flesh, bone of his bone. We are the body of Christ. We are not the body of Jesus. We are the body of Christ, the pre-existent one, the one that saw us and called us and brought us close to him. That's what Ephesians chapter 1 says. In his foreknowledge, he called us. He saw us. And before you had an opportunity to choose him, he chose you. Because he knew in time that you will choose him when you hear the word. So he wrote your name down. Long before you had a choice. He made a choice for you. So you are in. Say I'm in. Say I'm in Christ. I'm in Christ. 
I'm a new creation man. And Christ is in me. I'm his divine representative. And he is my divine representative in the heavens. I'm his representation in the earth. The one new man. Both heaven and earth. So this is what church for me is all about. It's about learning to know this relationship, this love order within deity. So our kingship is a subtext or a substructure of our intimacy with him, of our oneness with him. So we are one with him. In him we live, we move, and we have our being. Now, the Bible says in Genesis 1 and verse 1, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, Elohim. Elohim. Elohim brings to us an understanding of the plurality that exists within God. Father, Son, Spirit. So the first expression of God the word for Elohim, the singular is El, E-L. But the plurality is Elohim. And so in Elohim, the first expression of him is plurality of persons within his divinity. So when we want to know how to build on earth, we cannot build contextually something from the earth up but we've got to build something from the heavens down. Whatever we build from the earth up, studying the environmental impact or influence of, our, of the earthly dimension, we are building anything that relates to Babylon. Babel is built from the earth up to reach into the heavens. Anything that God wants to construct comes out from God. So we need to study God. We need to look at deity. We need to look inwardly into the inner core of the reality of who God is and begin to study God. But the Bible says no one knows the Father but the Son. And no one knows the Son but the Father. So it means that we need to encroach upon that relationship. If we ever thought that we knew anything about God, we must think again. Unless the Holy Spirit of God would reveal and help us to peep into that relationship. No one knows the Father but the Son, and no one knows the Son but the Father. So it is imperative that we know the Father by coming to understand who the Son is. If we want to know the Father, we need to have a proclamation of who the Son is. Like Peter, who do men say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Flesh and blood did not reveal that unto you, Peter. But it was revealed to you by my Father who is in heaven. The Father is the sole revelator of the identity of the Son. And we cannot study the Son by theology. We've got to study the Son by Christology. We got to, Christology is not something that you learn by natural acquiring or by intellectual reasoning, but it comes by revelation. That's why Paul cries out in first, in the, in the book of Ephesians chapter 1 from verse 16, 17 onward. He prays for the, for the Ephesian church. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened. That you might know the hope of your calling. He talks about the wisdom that he wants the, the unveiling of eyes to begin to see, not with these eyes, but the eyes of our heart, that it might be enlightened, that we might know that the word is epignosis. It means it's a deep revelation through intimate relational intimacy that we come to this knowledge of who the Son is and who the Father is. He says, knowing this then, that your old self has been crucified with Christ, Present therefore the members of your body as instruments of righteousness. Knowing this then, there needs to be an inner knowing. It's not external knowing by knowledge that come by much study. It comes by a revelation. And that revelation dawns upon you when you have intimate desire for who he is. And when you spend time with him, intimately deep 
in relationship that it begins to unfold and it begins to take the scales off from your eyes to begin to survey that which is eternal. That in time you can begin to reveal him that you have seen through your own structure of your own life. And this is how God builds. He wants us to see what exists in him. In God there is, there is Father. In God there is Son. In God there is Spirit. In God there is no competition but recognition. There are, there are equality of divine persons. There is ranking for function within the divinity of God. But there is no competition. But there is a recognition of the divine persons and the equality of those divine persons. And this is the way that the body must functionally stand in the earth. That what we see in the heavens, we begin to build upon the earth. There is, there is, there is an equality amongst us. Ranking can only come by grace that God has given us for function. So functional grace brings a ranking, but ranking doesn't mean equality, inequality of persons. So we are co-equal because we've been purchased by the same commodity. It's the blood of Jesus. And therein is vested your value. Do not devalue yourself. By having an orphan mindset. By thinking of yourself less than what God thought of you. When God thought of you, he thought that the only way for me to redeem you, to buy you back to me, is to spill my own blood. That's why now we don't belong to ourselves anymore. He purchased us. We are the purchased possessions of God. We no longer belong unto ourselves but belong unto him that purchased us. And now he says, honor God with your body. Honor the Lord with your body because you don't belong to yourself. Don't you know that your body is a temple in which God dwells by his spirit? Honor therefore God with your body. Paul comes later on and he says in, in, in Romans chapter 12, he says, I beseech you, brethren, to offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing unto God, which is your reasonable act of worship. True worship is not singing songs. We become worship. Worship externally singing songs is the evidence of a life that has been given over in the recognition that I've been bought with something that is so enduring. I've been bought, so my life become the expression of worship. I am to the praise of his glory. I'm not singing songs to worship him. I am worship. I am the evidence of worship. And singing songs is the external manifestation of worship. For I've given myself back to him. I am no longer my own. I belong to him. I belong to another. I become a bond slave unto Christ. I have my ears pierced that my hearing might only be given out to one voice, which is the voice of the Father, the voice of the Master. And so, what I want to do here is later on I would like to declare some prophetic things that the Lord has shown me about this nation and about other nations. And tomorrow... There's a whole lot of stuff that the Lord has shown me about South Africa, the nations, especially our nation, is right now in the heart of God. He wants to do something through South Africa. He wants to do something through this nation. The enemy once wanted to hijack this nation, but the Lord will not allow it to happen. God will rather remove those that say that they are, they, are in, they are now in government. But he will not allow his purpose for this country to fall by the wayside. There's some stuff God wants to do through us as the church of Jesus Christ. Starting in the tip of Africa, moving up to Kenya. Watch Kenya. It's also on the radar of God. Then moving from there to Ghana. Watch Ghana. And watch a nation that we all seem to be a corrupt nation, which is Nigeria. 
But God is going to begin to redeem some stuff out of that nation for His purposes. Because God, God wants to work strategically from the tip of Africa right into the very heart of Africa, into the north of Africa, cross into Europe, right into India. Watch India. God wants to do something through India. God is shifting things in the earth from northwest to southeast. There is a power struggle in the earth today. The west and the north is losing heat as the dollar influence upon world markets is taking a beating. And there is a new block rising in the earth economically that will become the new powerhouse. It is not by man's doing, but it's by God's doing because God has got his eternal purpose upon his heart. There's some stuff God wants to do, but he needs to shift things in the earth. Amidst all the turmoil and amidst all the, the stuff that is happening in the Middle East, there is something going on in the throne room of God. He's busy. And all the results of what we see on the earth is because of the movements of the one seated upon the throne. We not study God by studying the movements of God in the earth. But we go right into the heart of God. We go right into the throne of God. Stand in, in, in session with God. And hear the heart of God for the nations. There's something going on in the heart of Father. He wants to reclaim the nations for himself. But he wants to do it through a people. Through a people in the earth. Amen? So, in John 1.18, just a few more thoughts around this. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared or made Him known. So John uses the metaphor of bosom. Because we know that God is spirit. But He uses bosom. Some other uh, verses, uh, 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 other translations use the word loins. To describe our source and our origin. So he talks about the bosom, the place of great intimacy, affection and tender care. When he summarizes Jesus' relationship with the Father in John chapter 1 verse 18. The heart of the Father is the very source, the very protection, and the covering out from which the Son live, exist, and operate. When Jesus walked the earth, he would say stuff like this. John 5, 19, the son can do nothing out from himself. But he can only do that which the father shows him or the father has declared unto him. In other words, the son always lived in a, in a, in a posture of deference. A posture in which he allows the will of God to direct all his movements in the earth. He's become proverbially a eunuch. One that cannot bring forth out, from, his, out from, his, from himself, but he allows the will of the Father to direct him in the earth. And so God has got this relationship within himself. This was before anything was created. God the Son found God the Father to be his life source, to be his energy, to be his existence and his very consciousness. Without the Father, the Son had no existence, no life, no energy, no, no consciousness. He drew everything uh, from the Father. That's why he would say in John chapter 17, the following, he says the following in verses 4 to 5, I've glorified you on earth. I've finished the work which you have given me to do. Now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. He's asking something back that he had with God before the foundation of the world. He came, he suspended his deity in his humanity and in his incarnation. And he would not allow himself to operate out from the divine incommunicable attributes of deity. 
And whenever he would do something on behalf of Father, he would not draw upon him being God. He suspend that. And he would say, I will be coming uh, a son unto you. I will become the social continuance of you. I am the first one that burst open the womb. I am the generative power of my father. And if, and, and if you want to do anything, you got to do it through me. I burst things open for you. I am your firstborn. But there is an order of humanity in the earth ripening in the harvest fields that is like unto me. I am the first. I am the blueprint of the ones that are waiting to come into the state in which I am in my eternal dimension. So he is the God-man. He's the mediator. He's the intercessor. He's the anchor for our souls. He's the prophet, the priest, the king, the judge, the Lord, and all these offices is transmitting. He is apportioning. He is dispensing of himself into his body upon the earth. He is the apostle. He is the apostle and the high priest of our confession or our profession. And that profession is our sonship. So he is the apostle. He is the eternal one. He is the one that lives in the invisibility because he is coming to his rest. When he finished the work of redemption, he came and he said, it's finished. I've completed that which my father has desired for me to do. So now I can go back into the state which I had with him before the world was. And I'm coming back. And this same Jesus, whom you crucified, God has made him both Lord and Christ. And just like you see him go, so in the like manner he will come back. He will come bodily back. We, we believe in a bodily return of the Lord Jesus Christ. We will not spiritualize that act of him coming again when, when all things right now must be placed under his feet and to make it his footstool. And the last enemy to be overcome is Death, death to be overcome. And we know that that is where God is maneuvering his church to. He says in verse 24 of John 17, Father, I will that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. So this word glory, doxa, means the recognition of a reputation. Father, that which you held in your father's heart and mind concerning me in my state before I became human, before I took in my incarnation on the flesh of humanity that is sinless, that state in which I was with you when there was an eternal relationship between you and me in love, in the most intimate interwoven relationship. I'm longing to have that back. I want my glory back. I want those, that reputation that is existing within your father's mind concerning me. I want that back, Father. And he was not yet at the cross. And he says, Father, I want to share this with the ones you've given me. That's what he's saying here. That they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. And he was standing two feet away from his disciples when he was praying this prayer. Where was Jesus? He was with them, but he was also with him. And so God wants us to live, to live in these two dimensions simultaneously, being in the flesh, but yet being in the spirit. Understanding that we are spirit creations, that we are in the same order of deity. When he blew his breath into Adam in Genesis 2 verse 7, when he said, let us make man in Genesis 1, 26 to 27 and 28, let us make man, let us make an agent that can govern for us that which we have created. Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. The word image there also carries the understanding of identity. 
The very identity of God had to be in route into this vessel that he was going to make that is going to represent him exactly in the earth. And then he says, give this man likeness. Likeness has got to do with functionality. It's got to do with how we function in the earth. We need to function like God because we carry the very trademarks of who he is in our inward dimension of our lives. We are we carrying the very image of God. We are not just the resemblance of deity, but we are the very manifestation in the representation of whatever God is through a structure of human life called the church or the body of Christ. And so God had, right in the beginning, God had our, our rule upon his heart. He wanted to make an agent in the earth that could rule for him, that could become the standard by which he would measure. And he would give to that agent called man dominion, the right to rule. We have heard earlier on today the right to rule, kingdom. He wants to bring this human into that dimension. But it's very important to understand how this works. If I, as I, I want to I have a few moments so I want to I close off this and go into the prophet, prophecies. This theme of kingship is running right through the scriptures. We see it in Genesis, but it runs right through into Revelation, our kingship. So you find scriptures like Revelation 1, 5, and 6, Revelation 5, 9, and 10, Revelation 22, verse 3, you have scriptures that, that the Bible says he, he has made us a kingdom of priests. He made us kings and priests to reign upon the earth. He wants us to reign in a domain called the earth. But he wants heaven and earth to be brought under the authority of this vessel that he has made. And so kingship then is a fundamental subset of our oneness with Christ. We are joined to Jesus Christ by faith and that brought us into sonship. In 1 John 2 verse 6 the Bible says he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk as he himself walked just as he walked. 1 John 4 17 says as he is so are we in this world. Then in Ephesians 2 verses 4 to 6 the Bible says he made us alive together with Christ. He raised us up together and made us to sit together with him. So in other words, that our sonship cannot be lived out without him. In other words, we are in oneness, in union with him, in oneness with him. As he is, so are we in this world. And so we can only function functionally as kings in the earth out of our sonship identity. You can't function as a king standing functionally for God in the earth until sonship comes to a realization inside of all of us. It's very important that sonship comes into, uh, into our brains and our mindsets that we need to understand and recognize our sonship. And so there's a few more verses I just want to share with you. 1 Corinthians 6.15 Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? And then 1 Corinthians 6, 17, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Ephesians 5, 30 to 32 says, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Wow, that's deep. We are members of his flesh and bones. So his death was our death. His crucifixion was our crucifixion. His resurrection was our resurrection. His glorification was our glorification. Him being seated means we are seated. So we need to locate ourselves. Yes, we might live in flesh upon the earth, but in the spirit, we are in him. We live in him. We move in him. And we have our being in him. Amen? Okay. I know time is against me. So what I want to do, I'll pick up this theme tomorrow again. And I want to go into something different now and talk a little bit about 
the prophecies that the Lord has given me and uh, just draw a few things from there and just, just look at it together. Okay. Let's just see. Let us do the one that the Lord gave me in this month while I was praying, trying to hear the Lord. Uh, ALS Cape Town, July 2017. I'm going to read it for time's sake. Listen to this. There is yet another shift in the Skyros. There's a movement from temporal thinking to eternal thinking. Earth dwelling to the dwelling in, his, in the heavenlies. A lifting of our corporate gaze to see him who is seated upon the throne. A movement from being caught in the cycles of earthly reality to the perspective of the one seated at the right hand of God the Father. There should be a new boating, a new anchoring of our souls into the paradigm of him who sits at the right hand of the throne in majesty. The only way to function in the earth in victory is to have the mindset of where we are seated. A shift in understanding the current ongoing invisible hidden ministry of the man Christ Jesus according to 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, to be testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. There's an urgent necessity to see him who is invisible, like Moses who by faith, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin in Egypt, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he looked to the, to the reward by faith. Thus Moses forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. There needs to be a shift from, from temporal living to eternal understanding. Be, the reason why, because crises moments are going to come into the earth. There's going to be a cleansing of God's house. The fire of God is going to burn within his church to burn out the dross of the flesh of the old Adamic man. Anything from the mind of Edom, that which comes from the fleshly order, God is going to burn as he's going to come and visit his corporate temple. As in Matthew 21, he's coming again to overturn the tables. That which man has set up as tables of honor unto themselves is going to kick over. He's, he's plaiting a cord of, of, to make a whip again to come and cleanse and to come and bring back the due order, the proper order and arrangement of his house is what he is after. He's coming as a cleansing agent to come and cleanse the house of God. Every table in this season that has been birthed out of the flesh, God is going to shut it down. Listen to me. Every table that man has concocted out of their own brains that God did not gave us an agenda from the throne, God is going to shut it down. Those tables upon which man wants to display things of their fleshly orientation, God is going to shut those things down. He's going to overturn the table of the money changers. Those that merchandise the spirit that fleece the sons of God for self-enrichment. God is about to come and visit the house again. This is a season of cleansing. Say cleansing. cleansing. It's coming to cleanse the temple. Corporately and individually. God said to me, tell my people to check their marriages. To check their own children. To check their own lives. To see whether they have, are coming up to the standard of the throne. Which is righteousness and justice. So there's a measuring of the house. As we have heard this morning, Ralph was talking about. God is about to measure the house again. The ancient pathways and faith positions of the patriarchs are what the whole global church must come into. Secular governments 
will increase pressure upon the uncompromising church as corruption, incompetence, and greed will exponentially increase, says the Lord. Persecution will become a reality and will increase in jurisdictions deplete of present truth perspectives. And the need for closer relational intimacy and connectivity in the body is an imperative that can no longer be avoided. So one of the fundamentals for this season is that God wants the church to become one. That we not just talk it, but we are now migrating toward a deeper interconnectivity in the body of Christ. God is pulling his net, and anything standing outside of the net is going to be shaken. Because God is shaking everything and agitating us and coming to bring an end to everything that is of the order of the flesh. God is tired of the parading of men behind pulpits. That has become the witches that spew over God's people. As pride and arrogance persist, a further splintering of the governing party in South Africa is inevitable. The ANC is going to split again because of arrogance. God has warned that party. God is warning it again. Get rid of arrogance. There must be an active, intentional setting, a stubborn, unshakable establishment of the mind on things above. Not on earthly things, as seeking those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. This season demands a new mental attitude shaped by our corporate perception of the eternal as a real reality. When we see Christ as Lord objectively, exalted to the throne, then we shall experience in the midst of crisis the continued power and presence of the Spirit upon us. And when we see Christ as Lord subjectively, as the effective ruler within us, while being buffeted by earthly circumstances, then we shall know the continual power and presence of the Spirit in increasing measure within us. A bolting of the mind, will and affections and conscience onto Christ, the eternal anchor of hope for our souls, is imperative to survive in a corrupt, changing landscape of earthly reality. Hebrews 6, 90 to 20 says, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, looking continually in unwavering inward certainty and conviction to Jesus Christ, the author and the perfecter of our faith, for Father wants us to know that he is it is he who will appear perpetually on our behalf before the eternal throne of grace. An attitudinal shift is required, says the Lord. A mental reorientation, a new inner knowing and deep internal understanding without wavering of his sessionary work and current administration in the eternal throne. From God, this calls us to live in reckless abandonment for the glory and to the le live a life marked by fervent and expectant prayer, says the Lord. I hear a call for urgent, fervent, bold prayer initiatives. Not like in the old order of prayer, but a new fervency that will come. This was demonstrated for us by the early church in which every activity undertaken in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ was undergirded by deep, fervent, uncompromising prayer. A massive shift in how politics will, will be organized and orchestrated in South Africa will now occur as distrust, moral corruption continue to plague our nation. New political formations and a broader civil organization, or organization will be evidenced in the near future as the Lord's agenda impacts upon political spheres of South Africa. The Lord says that he will rescue the image of South Africa that got marred by orphan leaders. These leaders mirrored an image that is inconsistent with divine principle, says the Lord. It led to a veiling of what I always wanted to do in this nation, says the Lord. Many in the church world have set themselves up as leaders, but they are not of the Lord's choosing. 
They have called themselves and have organized themselves into pseudo-apostolic encampments, which became legalistic prisons in which my people are classified by false rank, says the Lord. The Lord says my sheep are being fleeced because shepherds idolize leadership models that distort the character and his divine order. Just like in the days of Noah, where a whole generation distorted and corrupted God's image, they consistently gave themselves over to evil. They operated inconsistent with the, with the divine intent and did not comply with covenantal heritage handed down through generational transfer. The result was that God, God's displeasure and judgment was kindled against that generation. However, the Lord found in Noah a system of redemption through righteousness which became the fundamental foundation that would sustain future generations. I am desirous of correct generational succession, says the Lord. A correct transfer of my covenantal values, says the Lord. The time has come to establish legacy to the fathers, that word comes. God says, I want legacy now in the earth, so that future generations may have guidance in their generations. Now God says, write the books. God says, now the books on this season must now be produced. To the fathers, God says, there is a young company of leaders waiting in the ranks, hidden but ready to come forth in purity, righteousness and integrity, never defiled by the love of filthy lucre and the desire for earthly gain. Seek them out, says the Lord. Gather them, build them, walk with them, invest in them, and commit to those faithful among them the prophetic register once delivered unto you, says the Lord. Like Jesus who revealed his relational, like Jesus who revealed his inner life, his ways of operation, and pathways of life to those closest in the relational commitment. Follow the prophetic instructions of Psalm 78 that was read by our brother this evening. When he read it, the Lord, my spirit jumped because that's one of the scripture verses that God says is now important for this season. Psalm 78 verses 1 to 7. I'm not going to read it. There will be a smashing of the independent spirit and a pooling of the Lord's divine net to shake whatever is out of divine order, uh, in our corporate journey. It is the struggle for the release from, from your mortality, an entrapment of geopolitical environmental influence and distortions upon our sight, says the Lord. It is a time to dwell in the moral and ethical heights of the eternal timeless perspective. Break out, break free from the narrow definitions of space and time, says God. You are not the product of your own history. You are neither the product of your culture and your race, says the Lord. Lift your gaze into a higher order of understanding. The houses which remain faithful in my testing times will be given new mandates in the season, says the Lord, to impact new and greater regions. The Lord says, see, I'm establishing you on the paths of my oneness and practical demonstration of my love as my oneness is being practiced like the church in the book of Acts. The sons of Africa will be released as firebrands into my harvest, says the Lord. Father reminds us today of the vision of fire from the tip of Africa into all of Africa. That is uh, South Africa, first South Africa, then into all of Africa. Watch Kenya burn with the unquenchable fire of my word, says the Lord. Then a quick spread into the regions of Kenya, then Nigeria and Ghana, then into Europe and India, and then the rest of the world. God is, there's an urgency in the heart of God for this to come forth. Jeremiah 5, 24, 24 says, Let us now fear the Lord our God who gives rain, both the former and the latter rain. It is the season, in its season, He reserves for us appointed weeks of the harvest. During the past 200 years, says the Lord, the church have witnessed the latter rain being poured out sporadically. But the fullness has not yet come. But God says, now it is coming. My fields are white unto harvest. Can you see it, says the Lord? Just do not say, four months more and then the harvest. Pray there for the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into the harvest fields. God says through the prophet Amos 4 and verse 7, I also withheld rain from you when the harvest was still three months away. I sent rain on one town, but withheld it from another. One field had rain, another had none and dried up. So two or three cities wandered to, from, 
to one, to one city to drink water, but they were not satisfied, says the Lord. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. God wants a full return of the heart, a full giving of the mind, a stop playing church and coming into the reality of this urgency that is burning in the heart of God for this nation. So it is time to prepare for the coming flood, says the Lord. Prepare for what Father wants to do in our land and in the earth. South Africa is his current focal point. The enemy wants us to abort the Lord's purpose. But what you witness in your land is the stirring of my spirit, says God. I'm getting ready to activate my true church into action. It will be a holy revolt against the true enemy of this land. It is not the government. Satan the accuser. The prosecutor, that ancient fallen prince who now is discerning that his time of blinding the minds of unbelievers has come to an end in this land. Now I stir a revolt in the spirit. There will be many more casualties in both political and economic and financial spheres, says the Lord. So I've stirred the pot of filth lying dormant into open manifestation and so to surface long hidden secrets of the heart of those set in agreement with the adversary. The battle is spiritual, says the Lord. We fight in the unseen realm. Now I've made my emissaries ready with battle strategies. I've given you this land. Now contend for it, says the Lord. Fight the good fight of faith for it. Lift up your eyes and survey the finish. I've set my throne in agreement with my true church, says the Lord. My discerning church. This is the time of your visitation. Mount up on wings of eagles and begin to soar on on the wind of my spirit in this land. Connect and join, come together, cluster together, form alliances and begin to shout on, the, on your walls for the cities of this nation is under the watchful eye of the Lord's spirit. One runner should run to another declaring to the king of Babylon that the cities of this nation is now under the control of the spirit of the Lord. This is a day of rejoicing. It's not a day of being sad, says the Lord, but it's a day of rejoicing, a day of triumph. I am the law enforcer, says God, and my throne is reverberating with divine activity in preparation of moving in favor of my remnant church. Just like Elisha prayed that the eyes of his servant might be opened to see that those who are for us are more than those against us. So also now I am with you, says the Lord. See, I bear my arm on your behalf. I will work a mighty deliverance in the midst of your crisis, says the Lord. Just do not fret. Look to me. Connect with, with true, authentic, apostolic, and prophetic leaders whom I have prepared for a time such as this. See, I establish a different relational order across your land. I have breathed over you and your spiritual formations and found some wanting. Weighed within my balances, says the Lord. It is time for my people to recognize the true authentic voices. I have raised up for a time such as this. The turmoil is nearly over, says the Lord. The shaking nearly concluded in South Africa. So rise up, says the Lord. My church in South Africa begin to rise in a spirit of trust. Triumph, rise from fear, rise from indifferent and nonchalance. I will restore the lost fortunes to this country. I will remove the current political leadership. Those that are, in, that are corrupt, those morally and ethically compromised, says the Lord. I am getting ready to shift my chosen leaders into place. De Decree it, says the Lord. Pass a law, says the Lord, over the cities of this nation. Declare it. Declare the arrival of a new day in South Africa. <laughs> this is the word of the Lord. Can we stand? Can we stand? Shalalamababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababababab